Hello world, we're here at Yale University outside of beautiful Sterling Memorial Library in the Center for Teaching and Learning for the fourth annual CS50 Fair. And I'm here with my good friend from college, in fact, Benedict Brown. Benedict, what's in store for us today? Well, we've got about 200 students in CS50 at Yale this year. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of exciting projects uh, that we're all looking forward to seeing. We're really excited this year to be in the library, which is a, a spectacular, beautiful space. Uh, lots of room for you to all come visit, even if you're staring at your laptop. Get up, hop on an airplane, get over here in the next half hour, and come enjoy our fair. Wonderful. So would you like to join us inside? Let's go take a look. Hi, everyone. This is CS50. I'm Jessica, here with Yusian. Hi. And she's going to... Uh, demo her project for us. So do you mind showing us what your project is? Okay, so just to introduce my project, what I did was um, a web app called Come Fly With Me. Um, in terms of what it's intended to do, it's intended to be able to track your flights, uh, the historical flights you've taken, the future flights you're gonna take, um, you'll be able to track that, and then uh, see where you, how long you've spent in each country, and then um, you'll be able to look up visa information as well to see how you're tracking along with that as well. So just to take you through my project itself, um, first, once you've registered, first of all, you register as a user. And then once you've registered, you can just log in. Um, in this case, I'll just use one of the test user setups that I've already uh, preloaded. And then once you set up, uh, you can see all the countries that you've had trips in. Uh, map up on Google Maps and then you'll be able to see how long you spend in each country. So for example, you spend five days in the UK. Um, if you have flights coming up in the future, you can just add flights through this process. You can look up historical trips that you've done in the past. You can look up by country. Uh, so for example, if I'm looking up Spain, I'll be able to find the flights that I've previously taken. Um, it will show that I flew into Madrid and then left Madrid five days uh, seven days later and I spent seven days in Spain itself. Um, you can track through and look through all your historical flights and then if you have any new flights coming up, there's the possibility of deleting it if, you, if some, your plans change and something doesn't happen or you can either uh, modify it, let's say, if um, the airline itself changes the flight details itself and otherwise you can also look up uh, visa information based on your where you're going to, um, what your citizenship is, what passport you hold, and whether you're traveling for business or leisure, and then it'll pop up with an external website which has all the information in it. But yeah, that's it. That's really awesome. Um, there's so many different components in here. It's really impressive. Did you have any CS experience before doing CS50? Um, so I did. I did an engineering degree that wasn't that coding heavy, but that was like 10 years ago. So it was a long time ago. <laughs> so a lot of this stuff you learned in CS50? Yeah, so I, I, I didn't actually um, do much in terms of web apps and all that in the past. So a lot of this was learned in CS50. A lot of it about like um, coding with Python um, uh, and being able to interface with like a client site and JavaScript and all that. So a lot of it was learned on the, on the go. And I've also had and had experience with like SQL and working with SQL and having a database and saving information to it. So yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Uh, did you have any like difficulties when doing this or any like big complications? Uh, definitely a lot of difficulties. <laughs> like you start off at the start thinking that I'm going to do all these things with this app. And then as you're working along, you realize that things take a lot longer than you think it would. Uh, but along the way, it was useful to, um, well, Googling is always useful. And otherwise, um, I went to the hackathon as well, was able to ask uh, some of the teaching fellows their uh, questions about uh, when I ran into like, uh, you know, debug uh, errors. And then, and then um, the CS50 hackathon was also very useful in terms of the seminars that I had. So one of the seminars that I went to was the API seminar, that, and that really helped me with like understanding how way to go about finding APIs and how to integrate it with my code. Yeah, it turned out really good. Thank you so much for demoing for us. Um, I'm Jessica, and this is CS50. Hi, this is CS50. I'm Jessica, here with... My name is Tigger. Ape. And they're going to show us a demo of their project. So can you show us a little bit something? Sure, absolutely. So. Initially, we decided to make a 2D application of a simple game, well, of a simple game, in which you essentially, you're a P set and your goal is to avoid Facebook and Instagram logos. You avoid the logos because you need to get your homework done, and these are distractions, and distractions are bad. 
<laughs> However, this game was a little too easy to code, so we decided to, you know, pump it up a little bit, and so... Oh, so why not? We tried making a 3D game. Um, because of time constraints, it turned into a 3D experience instead. So, if you go look to here, if I relaunched it, you would be able to see a uh, platform detection kind of uh, node that would say, okay, place the P-set here. For convenience, I've already pre-placed the P-set. It's an actual virtual object laying on the table, and it will stay there. But if you look up, every four seconds, you see a social media app randomly generated up here. Now, it seems overwhelming for now because I've let it run for quite a while, just for effect. But you got to get them away, so you push focus, and it launches a light bulb at them, allowing you to uh, stay focused on your P-set and avoid distractions. And this is a P-set protector. <laughs> That's really awesome and impressive. Like, did you guys have any experience with anything like this before doing nope. CS50? Nope. No, no not, none whatsoever. We found Swift to be an extremely challenging programming language. Yeah. Uh, but, but it was fun, so, you know. Yeah. Three months ago, could you imagine that you created something like this? No, I have actually always wanted to work with AR and VR, but I had no idea how to start. And I, even knowing all that CS50 would cover, I couldn't imagine that I'd be able to make something like this by the end. That's really awesome. Uh, what was the most exciting part about um, programming this or going through the process? What would you say? I mean, I'd probably say the most exciting part was this the constant incremental steps that we made. Like we would, you know, code something, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't work. And then eventually we'd have something very basic show up. So just every single one of those little basic experiences I thought was fantastic. Yeah, that's, it's so awesome, um, really cool. I'm really impressed, so thank you for showing us your demo. Um, thank I'm, you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Jessica, and this is CS50. Hi, everyone. This is CS50. I'm Jessica, here with Andrew and William, and they're going to demo their project for us. So can you tell me a little bit about what your project does? Yeah, so what we've done for our project is to create a lost and found site for Yale, the Yale community. So we're trying to find a way in order for people to declare lost or found items and try to have people return their items back to their given or lost users. Right, and so when you first come to our site, you'll be taken to our login page, which displays our logo and a small description. But since we've never been here before, let's create a new account. Um, that'll bring us to an account page and we are going to create a CS50 specific account. Um, filling out required information about a name, a username, a phone number, um, which will be random for now, and we'll also put in a simple password just for the sake of today. When we create an account, we'll be brought to our homepage, where you can learn a little bit more about our site, our mission, and also see some buttons that might help you navigate the site. At the bottom of the homepage, you'll see a recently found section with items that have recently been found on the site. But I can't see what we're looking for there today, so let's log a new lost item. Today, David has lost his famous phone book, and we can list some more attributes of the phone book. It's yellow, it's good condition, not very good, um, and he last saw it at the Center for Teaching and Learning, which is right around the corner from Sterling Memorial Library. Um, his phone book is important, but not that important, so he's gonna offer a $5 reward for anyone who finds it. And, we, and when we submit, we'll be brought um, to a new page with our account. And this account page basically says what David has logged for lost items and items that he's actually found. So people who have lost these items but haven't logged uh, what they've found, or what they've lost, can actually look for these find items. Now if we go to the find page, we can see what other people have declared lost. And let's say that David actually finds the TD flag. So he finds the TD flag and everything, and he wants the $356 reward for the TD flag. So he, all he has to do is press the more information button. And then we see that our head of college, Mary Lou, has actually lost our TD flag. And therefore, all we have to do is contact um, ml at yale.edu, and hopefully we could return the TD flag back to it for its rightful owner. Now, finally, the big thing about our app is once someone actually finds our, our lost phone book, we don't actually have to keep it back on the site. So what we've done is that once David has found his phone book, all we have to do is press this found button and confirm we found the item and delete it from the database forever. That's really awesome and impressive and also super useful. Like, I wish I had this when I lost my hat the other year. Um, yeah, so what kind of um, technologies did you use when building this web app? 
So we decided that we wanted to create mainly a website. And so knowing that we've used like Python and HTML in the past, especially when we're working on our past piece sets, we wanted to base our code off of that. So we used a lot of Python for our database holding all of our information. We use SQL and we use HTML, CSS, Java for like kind of the front end of the app. Yeah, had you guys ever used Python and HTML and SQL before coming to CS50? Um, not before CS50. I actually hadn't done any coding before CS50. Um, and I don't know, just looking at this now, it's kind of remarkable how big the improvement has been. Um, so it's cool to be able to combine all those different languages into one comprehensive project. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, what was the most exciting part of building this, or also like the challenges that you faced? I think the biggest challenges we've definitely had to face is just debugging the code because I think it takes a lot of patience in order to find like the minuscule errors that you might have made, like just spe spelling errors or like some variable errors that you might just need to kind of like slowly debug and take your time. But I think it was also a really fun project because we actually got to make a lot of decisions for ourselves, like how to create our own database, how to basically format our like code, our HTML, our CSS to make it look just as aesthetic as it does right now. And so I think it had a lot, there was a lot of fun parts to the to the job, but also a lot of challenges that came along with it as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, it turned out really great. The All the aesthetics are very nice, and that's I know that's quite difficult to do, so I'm very impressed. Thank you so much for showing us your demo of your project. Um, I'm Jessica, and this is CS50. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin. I'm live from the CS50 Fair at Yale. And today, I'm here with uh, Brayden, Jonathan, and Alvin. And they're going to talk to us a little about what they did for their CS50 final project. Yeah, so just to get started really quick, can you talk to us a little about um, what your project is and how you got the idea to do this? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll start. So basically, what the project does is we uh, get access to the user's Google Calendar. And it iterates through all of your events and find out when you are free. And the purpose of this is helps you schedule events with other people, and primarily using with when to meet the um, website. It helps you find the times that you're free, and then you can just automatically just input it into when to meet. It makes it a lot easier for you to schedule events with other people. Yeah, yeah. sounds very cool. So, um, can we get a quick look at how how it works? Um, all right, so we uh, we start from the terminal window here. Um, just run the program, and it uh, requests. Here, I can zoom in. Um, it uh, asks you when to put the start date and end date. So let's just say today. Uh, and let's start at midnight, uh, the previous midnight. And let's go till 10 days from now um, at 10 PM. And then it finds when you're free. Just like that. So those are all the times that people are free to then meet and schedule an event. Yes. Oh, cool. Those are all the times when on your GCal uh -huh. when you do not have a um, a previously scheduled event. Um, so that's when you could schedule a jam session or a meeting with a a club. Yeah, sounds really cool. So what do you? So this is um, I guess what you guys have so far. So what do you plan on doing in the future with this project? Well, like, what do you want the end product to really look like? Yeah. Oh, okay. So. Um, originally, we were going to have a basically this functionality, but it would take in multiple users' Google Calendar information so that it would just compare all of them to see when overlapping free times would happen so that um, everybody who's in a, in a club or um, just a group of friends, say, could get together and know exactly when they're all free. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, so the entire way, like, what do you, did you guys run into any problems? Like, what were some of your greatest obstacles in developing this project? Um, yeah, so one of you want to yeah. Sure. Um, so one of the main problems we ran into was just integrating with Google uh, Calendar API, um, dealing with the authentication, um, signing people into Google and keeping them signed in. Um, we didn't realize that that would be such a big problem at the beginning, um, but that was one of the thing, biggest things that we had to work through during the um, CS50 hackathon. Um, we banged our head against the wall for a few hours for that one. Um, but in the end, we decided to go to a different program, uh, simplify it down, um, kind of get, just try to make sure that the core of the program worked really well. Um, and that way, we can build up from there. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for sharing your project with us. Um, this is, my name is Kevin, and this is CS50.
Hi everyone, this is Kevin. I am live from the CSFD Fair at Yale, and today I'm here with Clara, who's going to share with us a little bit about what she did for her CSFD final project. Um, so Clara, uh, can you just give us a quick overview of what you did for your final project? Yes, so for my final project, I created a retail website in which you can browse a number of CS50 themed products. Um, so the first thing that you do is you have to log in and register with an account, and once you've done that, you can view any of your products that you would want to purchase, and you can add them to your cart, view your order history, and do everything that a normal retail website would do. Oh wow, really cool. Can you give us a quick run through of like, what it looks like? Yeah. So you're first, when you go to the website, you're prompted to register with an account. Um, I ever, I've already made an account, which is just with a pretty basic username and password, not at all secure, but just for the purposes of demoing it. Once you've logged in, you'll be redirected to the home page where you can view any of the CS50 themed products. And from the home page, you can choose to add them directly to your cart. So say you want three ducks, you could add three ducks to your cart and it'll notify you that it did it successfully. Or alternatively, you can click on a product and have a short description and then determine if you want to add it to your cart from there. Um, and at any time during your shopping process, you can view the products that are currently in your cart by clicking on the cart tab, where you're also given the opportunity to remove a product from your cart. So say you only want two ducks, you could remove one from your cart and it will notify you that it did that successfully. And then when you're done, you can proceed to checkout um, where you want to enter your information this is just simulating the checkout process, so it won't require the user to enter actual credit card information because we can't store it properly. But in theory, this is this process would check that the user information is valid um, and ensure that ensure that they are properly placing their order. And upon doing so, it'll notify you that your order has been placed, and you'll be notified once it's shipped. And upon purchasing your order, two things happen. The first is that um, your cart will be emptied so you can keep on shopping with like a fresh slate. And the second thing is that you can view your order history um, and we just purchased two ducks and two bags as you can see down here. Um, over the course of the day we've placed a lot of orders so hence the, someone ordered 100 CS50 shirts because you can never have enough CS50 shirts. And so yeah, that is our website. So while you were developing this and making it, did you run into any problems or uh, like some things that you didn't expect or anything like that? Yeah, I think one of the hardest things was figuring out how to, once you added a product to your cart, how to redirect, um, redirect it to the proper route so that if you're adding a duck to the cart, it would insert the proper number of ducks to the database with the proper quantity and the proper um, price and then the total cost. Um, so that you could easily view that in the cart. And then making sure that just stylistically, say you already had a duck in your cart and you wanted to add another, instead of adding another row, it would just increment the quantity. It was just thinking ahead about things like that um, so that it would actually reflect the way a real retail website would function. Yeah, and so if you had, uh, my last question is, if you had like more time to develop this, what do you think were so, like, some features you definitely want to add to it if you had more time to work on this? Um, there are probably two things. The first one would be that we would make the checkout process more of a legitimate process that would s secure or store securely the user's billing information. And then the second thing is that we hard-coded each of the products into our HTML page so that each of these is a separate um, like link to the product description. But instead, we could create just a template for what we would want that to look like and then have the HTML page itself um, more efficiently input the product information so that we wouldn't have to do it uh, specifically for each product. Yeah, well thanks so much Clara for sharing with us. My name is Kevin and this is CS50. Hi everyone, this is CS50. I'm Jessica and I'm here with... Veer and Hal. And they're going to show us a demo of their really cool project for us. So do you mind showing us and explaining what it does? Sure. So. Say you have a, a song playing from a device that's not yours. Uh, I'm going to start playing the sample of Avicii's Wake Me Up from my friend's computer. Um, our program will take in the audio input. Uh, I'm pressing the record button right now. It will record what's being played. It'll fingerprint that, it'll fingerprint that using uh, Fast Fourier Transform compared to a database of songs that it has uh, stored locally and figure out what song is playing, figure out what time in the song it is, and play in sync on my own computer. Um, so the whole fingerprinting process takes about 30 seconds, uh, but after that it should, it should be playing in sync.
Yeah, that sounds really awesome. What are some uses that you might want to use this app for? Sure. So, uh, say for example, you are, you're at a big venue or a big party, and you want to you have a lot of speakers, but you can't hook them up together, to, uh, and you want to play the same song from all of them. Yeah. So, you can using this program, you can get all of them running on this program and get them all playing the same song in sync, uh, and really increase the volume of the music or something. Yeah, that's really awesome. Can you just show us how this is working right here? Yeah. So uh, basically. Once it's taken on the audio input, it recognizes uh, at, at what time in the song did the audio input start, and it combines that with how long the processing took to start playing from the timestamp uh, that the, the addition of those two times, um, and then it just plays the song um, from the file that we have stored locally on our computer. Yeah. So now it's playing from both the original computer and your computer. Yes. Yeah, that's really and, neat. Uh, in the future, if you can use this with, with multiple devices, more and more devices, you can get even more and more noise. Uh, it could be pretty useful that way. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, did you guys have any experience with any of this kind of stuff before CS50? Uh, not at all. Uh, I barely had any programming experience, um, but CS50 really gave us a pretty broad knowledge in many areas. So, for example, in this project, we use uh, Python for the back end, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for the front end, and we make pretty heavy use of SQL as well uh, for creating the database of the audio, of the fingerprints, all of which we learned through CS50. Yeah. Yeah, that's really awesome. Like three months ago, could you imagine that you had been doing this? Not at all. No. Um, I, like this is a bit similar to Shazam, so I, I, I was wondering like how is that even possible? Uh, but it's really cool that this class has given me given us the skills to implement the algorithm and improve it ourselves. That's really amazing. Did you guys um, face any challenges while making this though? Yeah. So um, there are some challenges in installing all the right packages, getting all the functions working. For example, the audio fingerprinting. Um, all of the Python packages for that, especially since uh, recently, since Python switched from Python 3 to Python 2, a lot of the packages were incompatible. So we had a bit of difficulty with that. Uh, MySQL got some changes to it. But after we figured that out, it was pretty fun and pretty uh, like doable, especially with everything that we learned from the class. Yeah, that sounds really neat. Those uh, updates can be really frustrating sometimes when you have to do them, right? Yeah. But what was probably the most exciting thing about getting to do this? Definitely the moment when it started playing in sync. The first, the first time it yeah. worked, we were we started just like kind of we almost like jump for joy. We were like we we had been so long, we had so many bugs that when it finally started working, we were just pretty happy. It was awesome. Yeah, no, that's the best moment when after all these trials and then it's finally working. Yeah. Super exciting. It's so cool, and I'm really impressed with like I don't know how this works. So really cool. Thank you. Work. Yeah. Thank you so much for demoing for us um, and showing it to everyone. Um, this is Jessica, and this is CS50. Hi, everyone. This is Kevin. I'm live from the CS50 Fair. And today I'm here with Mossy and Brian, and they're going to share with us a little about their CS50 final project. So yeah, so just a quick overview. Can you tell us about what your project is about and um, how you got the idea for your project? Um, our project is called Food for New Haven, and it's an Android app that aims to connect food banks, people in need, and donors more efficiently because we want to improve our pre-existing program on how um, all of these parties are communicating with each other, and we aim to um, consolidate um, all the information that's been circulating around this situation so that it's more efficient and um, just easier for them to know what's going on, what resources that they can obtain from food banks, as well as what resources um, they can donate to food banks. Yeah, so could you just uh, very quickly show us like how it works and stuff? Um, so when right. you first so open the app, you're taken to a Google Maps interface um, that displays local um, nearby food banks such as St. Thomas More and Downtown Evening Soup Kitchen. So because we're using a Google Maps interface, you're also able to access um, the addresses of these places as well as directions on how to get there. Um, we began, um, we started communicating with St. Thomas More and Iris and they've expressed interest in um, becoming involved with our project so we're going to be following up with them with more information about that. So when you click on a marker for on Google Maps, um, it's going to take you to info window, which is going to transfer you to another activity page that displays a table of resources um, that's needed by the food banks that they already have, as well as the food banks themselves. I'll take over from here. So from here, obviously, as mentioned, this is a list of all the food banks as well as the needed supplies and the supplies they have in stock. Right now it's blank, but let's say that you are a food bank and you want to update your supplies so that everybody can see. So let's say I'm downtown soup kitchen. I would go to update table 
and I can put in an authentication key given specifically to that location. So obviously I being a theoretical employee at Downtown Soup Kitchen, we put in soup one, and then let's say that we need soup, and let's say that we have crackers. So after I input the, these words into the fields and hit submit, it'll update this list with whatever it is that the place has or whatever it is that the place needs. So obviously everyone should be able to see this so that way both donors know what these places need and people in need because um, a considerable majority of people have access to the internet and also smartphones. Um, they can see what it is that they have in stock so they can go where they need food, toiletries, whatever it is. And that is the implementation of our app. We're hoping that we can get it on the App Store itself, on the Google Play Store. And hopefully we're going to be continuing to talk to the local food banks to see what else we can do to implement this project further. That yeah, sounds really cool. While you're developing this, did you guys run into any unforeseen like obstacles or any problems? Or I'm assuming this type of stuff must be wild, like really hard to make. Yeah. One of the main difficulties that we had with implementing this project was the idea of a database because all this information for the list need to be stored somewhere, right? And the thing is, is that right now, currently, it's implemented in a local database, but when we push this to the App Store, we would need to have it in a global database so that way everyone, regardless of who is using the app, would be able to see the same information. That comes with actually pushing it to the, play, to the Google Play Store to begin with, so that implementation would have to, ha have to happen then. But that was like a major issue because then otherwise, how is the data going to proceed? Assist. How is everyone going to get the same information? How is it not just going to be bound to a single app? Um, but other than that, like it, it was a, it was very much new territory for us because we've uh, never worked in Android Studio before. We never worked in Java, so it was uh, very it's a very rough ride. But um, we were able to find the resources we need to actually do it. Thanks to both people here at CS50 and also online resources like Android's Developer Clip. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your project with us, and um, good luck with everything in the future as you develop this in the future. Thank you. Um, yeah. My name is Kevin, and this is CS50. Hi, this is Kazemi, and I'm here with Skylar. Skylar, tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about your project. Yeah, sure. So um, my project is a website called Mile One Running Club, and it's tailored for beginner runners who are interested in getting training plans um, for whatever their first race might be, whether that's a 5K, a half marathon, or a marathon. So a lot, of, a lot of things on the internet are really tailored to experienced runners. So with this, you can register. If we just go here, um, and then you can enter some information. I don't know what you want your username to be. I can just make it CS50 for right now. Um, call it CS50. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to call it David Malin. Awesome. Um, OK, and then say you're training for a 5K. And say the race is 10 weeks away. You hit register. Um, and this will record all of your information. You can then click for your training plan. Um, and this basically breaks down your training plan into exactly how many weeks you entered. Um, and it has a clear build-up period where you're increasing in mileage in preparation for the race. And then it draws back the mileage um, so that the week before the race, you're really um, just resting and preparing. Uh, so this kind of reflects like, you know, it's just some basics about running in general, but it is really tailored for people who have no experience and couldn't be able to find this information anywhere else. So it seems like you have a lot of, like, expertise about running. Um, how did you translate that into the code and, build, and into building the website? Yeah, so the highlight of the website is definitely the training plan algorithm. So what I basically did was just go back from, you know, just experience. So I did, like, cross country and track all four years of high school um, and just had an idea of, like, what the maximum mileage that a beginner could possibly train up to. So I first chose the maximum mileage of each different race. So for um, like the 5K, the maximum mileage is eight. For a half uh, marathon, the maximum mileage is 14. And for a marathon, it's 20 miles. So these are all like values you should be able to run pre prior to your race in order to really perform well. Um, so then I took that and basically just um, did some calculations to have the percent buildup um, in your plan. So that's about 70% of the time you should be increasing in mileage. And then the rest of the time, so the next 30% is when you're decreasing um, in mileage. Uh, and then it also has like a pretty logical progression in terms of the percent increase in the total mileage per week that you're running. Um, and that's just kind of to prevent injury so you're not like increasing too fast um, or trying to run too many miles too soon so like you'll get injured. Yeah. And what, what was the most difficult thing when you, when you were building this website? Um, I would say that the most difficult part of it was definitely 
um, the design of this. So the training plan is something that like I've been really familiar with like for a lot of time in terms of like building some for myself and my teammates. Um, but I don't have any pr like prior coding experience, so this class was definitely um, an experience. And uh, yeah, so learning like how all the different pieces of web programming work together, like how to fit HTML with CSS and JavaScript, uh, that was definitely the most challenging part. Yeah. And can you just walk me through like the export as PDF because that just seems like the last step. Yeah. I don't know. It seems really interesting. Yeah. So basically, you just export it as a PDF, and then it'll save it to your desktop. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Nifty. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Huh. Maybe I'm gonna have to go run after this. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Skylar. This this looks this is a great project, and it looks beautiful, by the way. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. This is Kazami, and this was CS50. Hi, this is Kazemi, and I'm here with Kat and Lena. Uh, Kat and Lena, tell me a, bit, a little bit about your project. So our project is a website where um, people can find information about local opportunities where you can find food, shelter, clothes, and other assistance. Um, it's called Help New Haven. Here we have tabs where you can see specifically opportunities about food, uh, clothes, shelter, and other. Um, we also have a map which shows the locations of the areas. And when you press on a pin, you can see the information of um, that opportunity. For places that, for people who may not have access to Wi-Fi and internet, there's also a PDF printable version of all the information in a table where the, the church or the food bank can print out the information and hand it out to people. So the reason why we decided to create one website was because we know how hard it is sometimes for people to find uh, resources online, especially from places that aren't allocating their resources towards creating a pretty website, but rather towards the people themselves. Um, so we wanted to create one place where events can register and add their own events, and they can edit them as they desire. So here we have a create an event page, and as you fill out the events, you can have them repeat weekly or not. And for example, like if you go to your events, all the events that you created show up there, and right now we don't have any, but um, you can edit the event if it were there, and you would be able to change the name, the location, uh, the description of the event. For example, if you had an event that was a one-time thing, but it was extremely successful, then you can have it repeat weekly without having to write it in over and over and over again. Um, and you can also delete the um, event from the database completely if, for example, like you ran out of resources and stuff. But yeah, so... Our entire point is just to try to help people from New Haven who might be struggling. Yeah. Well, what was the most difficult uh, piece of putting all this together? Because it looks great and there's so many different features going on. Uh, yeah. I think we had um, a difficult time like fixing the format because we wanted it to look very nice and easy user interface. So when you go to the home with the cards here, um, they were getting a little glitchy on us, so it took a while to get that working, but once we did, um, it looks really good. <laughs> and where, where do you see this project going? Do you think, do you think like you're going to approach local organizations and try to roll this out, actually? Yeah. Um, I, I, I definitely see us expending, uh, especially because we've only been talking to um, a very select number of organizations right now. And uh, a lot of students have come up to ask if we're going to expand to other cities. But I feel like we should probably build a really strong foundation in New Haven first before we do that, uh, just because I feel like we should focus here. We are in New Haven, Connecticut right now. Um, like Yale is here. And I feel like we should focus on the community here. Um, so I um, actually volunteer at a soup kitchen, which, which is where we got the idea to do this. And I've been talking to a few people who go there. And they are really excited to see like this actually roll out. And I've been actually getting questions about it for like the past month when we've been working on it. Yeah, so we really hope to make it live and actually working. This is wonderful. I, I like wish the best for both of you because this is such a like a fantastic project, and I can definitely imagine seeing it having this like big impact. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great job, you guys. Once again, this is Kazemi, and this is CS50. I'm Catherine, and we are coming live from the CS50 Fair today at Yale. Here we are with two students. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Uh, my name is Victoria Sher. And I'm Alexia Akbay. Yeah, and they're going to walk us through our project, which looks really exciting with their like fish tank and all these materials. Um, so we took the hardware track on the project and we used a Raspberry Pi, which is basically a microcontroller, and we linked it to an environmental sensor. Um, in this case, we used dissolved oxygen, 
and what it does is the microcontroller will talk to the sensor and um, we created a program that after every reading with the sensor, it's about two minute interval between each reading, the data will be sent up into the cloud or server that we're using and then we use this um, available like dashboard online to visualize all of the readings um, and so here you can see that every two seconds you get a bit of fluctuation on the gauge and then it's plotted below. Um, we also embedded kind of a geo tracker for the sensor and a little bit of an educational video um, to explain why dissolved oxygen is important um, and we're environmental health students at the public health school and we, um, it's really important to collect data about our environment, so we wanted to kind of bring it into more of a technological um, terms, I guess. Yeah. Um, maybe you can explain some like the languages and tools that you use to create this? Um, yeah, so we work mostly in Python. This was our first time working with hardware ever. Um, so kind of, we started off with an Arduino and then went to a Raspberry Pi, and so learning how to work with the hardware was a big challenge, a really big learning curve for sure. Um, and then within that we worked with Jupyter Notebook, also wrote a Python file in there, and then we did a bit of JavaScript with the dashboard. Um, what would you say were some challenges that you encountered on this project? Um, the biggest thing I think was just the learning curve with the hardware, and we just found it really <laughs> challenging. Um, just learning the syntax with everything and even just figuring out how it flowed and where information was going at times. Yeah. Yeah, it's especially difficult when you're working with other people's hardware and trying to make them compatible because you have to learn the language that it was kind of coded in to begin with and dissect that and teach yourself their, um, yeah, the different ways that the data is taken care of within that hardware. So that was definitely a big barrier to implementation for us. Yeah. Very cool. And so where did the idea come from? Is this one of your fish? This is, uh, this is my fish. Um, his name is Rue. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, we are environmental health students and a lot of times we have a lot of difficulty getting data from the environment and it's, we've heard a lot about IoT, so this is like an IoT sensor. Um, and so it would be great if you could just kind of have these sensors set up everywhere or like in places of interest to track how the environment's changing and how that could be affecting our health or the environment itself. So we hope to see this kind of expand as a possibility. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any final takeaways from the project? Um, it was a really great learning experience. I really worked, uh, liked working with Alexia and just had a lot of fun kind of taking this idea from start to finish and actually seeing it work was really rewarding. Okay. Uh, thank you guys so much. And I'm Catherine and this was CS50. Hello world, my name is Colton Ogden and I am joined today at Yale by... Michael. And uh, Michael, what uh, application... Oh, also, by the way, we are joined by a, a third guest here. Uh, what, is, what is our third guest's name? That's my young son. His name is Adam. He's only five months old. Uh, congratulations on that. And uh, we're actually going to find out this is actually relevant to your final project today. So what is your final project? So my final project is an app which collects all the data you might ever want to analyze about a, your baby and how much is he eating, how many diaper changes do you need per day. Believe it or not, it's super important for pediatricians. Whenever your baby is crying too much and you want the device, this is the th first things they ask you about, so you have to have it at hand, available all the time. And this is, this is the kind of data that you're typically taking track of multiple times every single day. And so doing it, you know, even the process in and of itself can be tedious, but you've written an application that sort of helps provide this information to your pediatrician, is that correct? That's correct. And believe it or not, it's super funny how simple things get uh, your, make your life easier, and also like how simple things are difficult to do manually. Like the pediatrician asks you about, like, oh, on average, how much is he eating per meal, and you'd never know that because you just have a stream of numbers. Right. So it's very important to have access to that like straight away. And your application actually does this, the analysis of this information as well. That's correct. Okay, let's take a look actually at your application. So uh, this is this page here. I think we. We went to one of the side pages. Do we want to go to the maybe the main page yeah. here? I can uh, since you're holding your son, I'll uh, maybe steer for us a little bit here. So the application is called Baby Note. That's correct. Then my wife came up with an idea. And uh, your wife is actually here with us today. What's your wife's name? My my wife's name name is, is Kate. That's awesome. And congratulations both of you on uh, on your on your new Thank child you. once again. Um, so this is the homepage here of Baby Note. Is that, is that correct? 
Correct. And so this is all the data that we have, all of the, the sort of the analysis of the data for uh, for your son here. Is this is that this information for him? Or it's not for data? him. It's just it's just some mock data. It's, it's just random numbers. Yeah. But this sort of at a glance, it's kind of like a dashboard, it lets you see sort of all of the different uh, data that your pediatrician would be curious to, to know um, over the course of time. Um, so there's different sections here. You want to explain some of these sections? Yeah. So this section is essentially forms which you can use to. Um, Oh, which you can use to um, yeah, we can let you drive to, if you to, want at this to, point. Pu to put in the data. So, for instance, let's say you want to put the information about your diaper change. So this, the way it works, it's just the system automatically plugs in the the uh, time data for you. Oh, that's convenient. Very convenient. Yeah, I thought it would be a useful feature. I have different times on my computer, so that's why it's, there's a different sure. time. Uh, but it's uh, 25 past uh, 1 p.m. here, um, and then the only thing you have to select is like the diaper, what it was, like, was it wet, dirty, or both? So let's say it was wet, I click Submit. Super optimized process, yeah. features that your pediatrician is sort of uh, exactly. minimizing for you. And the record is just added here. Okay. And it will be on a day-by-day basis. So for instance, if you want to add another one, you just, let's say, add another one, you click Submit, and it's again, you have two per day, so it, it's on per day basis. This is something very important for the pediatrician. Okay, okay I see that. Let's, let's look at some of the other uh, categories that we see up at the top here. So we have breastfeeding, bottle feeding, pumping. Exactly. All things that the pediatrician is going to care about. Yeah. Making sure they're taking care of the baby uh, you know, appropriately, giving it a certain success. Yeah, so breastfeeding, for instance, like you can, um, when, what time did you start? What time did you end? How long was the session? What was the position? Uh, you, when you held the baby? Uh, for bottle feeding, I think this is one of the most important things because this shows how much baby is actually eating. This is something you can measure. You can't really measure the breastfeeding, how the, the amount itself, but only time. But for both feeding, you can also measure the, the amount he's eating, and it's super important that you keep track of it so that to make sure that baby doesn't get jaundice, for instance, uh, when he or she doesn't eat, too, doesn't eat enough. So, for instance, you can choose, okay, let's say that my session took me quite a, quite a long time, and it was just only breast milk, and it was, I don't know, 75 milliliters. You click Submit, it's like added. This is a confirmation for you. Clean design of the yeah. website also, by the way. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the technology that you used to implement it. So what is your website built on? What did you use to implement the website? It's built in Flask and it's using mostly Python. The database is in SQL. Okay. Uh, there are pretty complex SQL queries. Some of the analysis, the, the numbers analysis for this, um, for the dashboard is mostly done in Python because they realized that you know, it wasn't complex enough to employ some statistical package, sure. but it was too complex for a SQL query to handle. Nice balance sort of in between. So, and yeah. It's nice to sort of leverage the tools that CS50 even uses for its finance piece, for example. Yeah, exactly. And there are kind of uh, like to make like, make your life easier, some things are pre-filled in the forms using JavaScript. Nice, that's really cool. It's really cool to see you sort of use the same technologies, but use it for a different use case. Mm -hmm. Very clean design. Um, and you are actually from the business school. This is your first. This is your first programming course. Period. Correct? That is very correct. That is very true. We were talking about it sort of before. You uh, going into the course, you had never seen any programming before, and now you come all the way from writing hashtags to the screen to implementing a full website that actually has a use case that's relevant to your life, which I think is really cool. That that is exactly right. In a way that we don't really see from a lot of projects. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I, I can confirm that. I, I've seen, that, that was the first time I've seen C. I started from printing hashtags on computer screen and I ended up to making my own app. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself, even though it was a bit of a stretch on my family as well. But I made it, I'm super happy. Yeah, well, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Thank I really you. Appreciate it. Thank you, for, thank you for having the interview. Uh, very proud of the work that you've done. And I'm so happy to see thank that you as so a, much. a use case for your life as well. Thanks. Uh, my name is Cold Nog, and this was Michael with his uh, Baby Note application, and this is CS50. Hi, this is Catherine, and we're back here at the CS50 Fair. Um, right now, I'm with one student, Paul. If you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm doing an architecture major and I'm in second year in grad school. And yeah, I'd like to show you my project, which is Dancing Lights. Yeah. So, um, so how this works is actually, um, I try to map the LEDs to the Xbox Kinect sensor. So if I move my hand in, in front of the Xbox Kinect sensor, the LED lights actually corresponds to the movement and the gesture of this. So it's kind of like an interactive design where I'm trying to find an application in architecture and try to expand this, this, this logic yeah, to something that's bigger and more interesting. Yeah. Um, where did you get the idea for this project? I guess um, it, 
this idea actually came from like one of my one of the projects I've seen online, which is like very big light installation, but they react to like music. So I'm thinking like, what if like a human or like someone is there physically in a space and then interacting with the lights? Would it be like more interesting for me? Yeah. Very cool. Um, so what languages did you program with this? And uh, what tools from CS50 taught you how to make this? So um, I programmed this with Arduino and processing. And the language that is used is uh, C++ and Java. Yeah, so what, if, what I've learned in like CS50 is really useful because it taught me how to like write the uh, what is it the coding logic and also learning the syntax, which makes it really easy to like transfer between like different languages. Yeah, and it makes coding a lot more fun and interesting because I understand the basics and fundamentals. Um, can I try out your project real quick? So this is your light sensor, right? This yeah. is the connect. So do I put my hand over here? Yeah. So Hand gets inside this zone and you appear okay. to detect So my hand's here. Oh cool, and the lights are showing up over there. So you put it over here? Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's a really cool project. Um, what like ideas do you have for this in the future? Like to expand on your project? I guess it is possible to make it a uh, slightly bigger scale. So I kind of imagine this like in a room that's filled with different lights and different size and a lot bigger. And if the person is able to walk through the lights, in between the lights, he's able to interact with the lights in different ways that I imagine, yeah. So like it's more of like a sensual and like lighting design to me, yeah. Um, so did you have any CS experience before coming into this class at all? No, absolutely not. I, yeah. I came in like not knowing anything, but but just through the process and learning every single thing, it's it's just awesome. It's like I, I felt like I, I know so much more than before, and like like computing sounds like seems to be so much more interesting than I thought it would be. Like it's not just dry coding, but you can do something really interactive and like exciting in, and that that's what I love about this course. Yeah. Okay, I'm so glad and congratulations on finishing the course and we're at the end of the semester and we're all very proud of you and your really cool project. So thank you so much and I'm Catherine and this is CS50. Hello world, my name is Colton Ogden and I'm joined today by Isaiah Stenzel here at the CS50 Fair at Yale. Uh, what year are you Isaiah? I'm a first year. And uh, you've taken CS50. Was this your first year taking CS50? I, or, sorry, uh, doing any computer science programming? Um, I had an interest in high school, but only a little bit of Python, but no actual programming ex experience. Okay, awesome. And then uh, show us what you uh, built today here. What's, what's it called? What's it called? Yeah, so I made a website called LunchLink that lets um, Yale students randomly get lunch together. And it's designed so where you can meet people outside of your own social group, people you normally wouldn't talk to. Um, and you can log on and create an account. Um, it's currently an opt-in service, so it doesn't sample from all of Yale's people yet. Um, that's a future goal for it. And currently when you go on, you can um, make your profile and update your profile information with like your class year, your college, and your major. And it'll tell you how complete your profile is as well. And then to find a link, uh, people or to have like a lunch link you can click here or up here and you can filter by those fields so let's say you're nervous and only want to meet other first years or people in your college uh, so like I'm in Murray and then find a lunch link I've linked with Lemurs um, and that's just the person's username if they were to log in they would actually see they're linked with you and currently this is where it is, you can only say finish this lunch. Um, in theory, you can't actually communicate with them in person or over the app. Um, but in the future, I want to make it to where, at that point, it would send an email to the person. Um, and you can communicate through that email anonymously to where you actually don't know anything about this person besides their username up until the point you meet. And that way, you don't have any bias on who they are or how they think and it's just a random way to meet new people. 
Yeah, I like that sort of anonymity aspect to it where you're not able to sort of pass judgment on anybody before you actually meet them for the first time. Yeah. I think yeah. that's cool. I think that allows you, you, you touched on uh, an example that you, you yourself have done using a similar service, some, somebody that you would have not have uh, probably met otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Or I was uh, talking to him earlier. I actually, this is inspired by um, basically doing this process manually. Me and a couple friends decided, like using the Yale Facebook to randomly choose people for each other and just send them an email and of course you could see their email field and know their name so it's slightly biased but besides that it was entirely don't know who they are and um, I actually matched with Berkeley's writing tutors in her 60s and it was a really fun interesting like hour-long lunch yeah, something that you probably probably wouldn't organically happen as easily as yeah. say meeting other freshmen or sophomores necessarily. Yeah, I would never actually run into that situation. Yeah, let's talk about the stack that you've uh, built this website on. So, what is this implemented in? Um, it used uh, CS50's IDE environment, um, and it just uses um, Python along with like HTML pages and some JavaScript to have like interactive things. So um, essentially, sort of the the CS50 finance stack, more or less. Yeah, the, yeah. With and Flask it, it and uses uh, like Flask and the SQL, SQL database. Um, like when you make and register an account, it's added to that database. The one thing uh, that I noticed that I, I thought was really cool was taking the like adding new feature to it that we didn't teach in CS50. That being this progress bar here, we don't really necessarily teach that. But it's a bootstrap component that you went out and found and integrated yeah, to your yeah. website as by just figuring out which of the three fields of a user's registration are null, and then you you know calculating the percentage, just playing that percentage here, and then you know when they fill out it gets updated. Which is, it's cool going to the next yeah. step, right? Yeah, and that was just this is actually one of the easiest things for me to do. Like I was telling someone earlier that just making two columns was super difficult, but like doing the bootstrap updated progress bar. You just use like some Jinjud in the HTML itself and just do a little simple math and it's done. Yeah, they so. make it super easy. Do you see yourself did continuing to take more CS classes in the future? Um, I might take some more CS classes. Um, I'm a mechanical engineering major, so there's not much squeeze room there. Nice. No, but I understand. Yeah, Understandable. I definitely think like any major you have, like I'll use this in mechanical engineering. Uh, even Even just the logic of like programming and thinking. Uh, yeah, it's a really great skill to have. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Isaiah. Appreciate it. Thank you yeah. for, for interviewing today. Definitely. Um, this was Lunch Link, and uh, this is CS50. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine again, and we're back here with some two new students. And would you guys like to introduce yourselves to the camera? Um, I'm Eden. I'm a first year in Morse College. Um, hi, I'm Kevin. I'm a first year in Berkeley College. Yeah. So, did you guys want to walk us through your um, website and how you create? Yeah, definitely. Um, so essentially, we created a web application that's focused and more uh, geared towards first-time voters and people who are new with civic engagement. Um, and we really wanted to help them find a way to express their voices um, as effectively as possible. Um, so the main function of our website um, is centered around a text search box where people can um, insert the abbreviation of whatever state they're interested in, and then it'll take them to a page that um, kind of synthesizes everything that they need to know to register to vote um, in that particular state. And then we do have some validation um, uh, pop-up boxes with our box, um, so you can't type more than two letters, um, or you, if you try entering an invalid um, code, it'll come up with an error message that says you need to put a proper abbreviation. Um, so for example, I'm from Colorado, so if I wanted to find out how to vote in that state, um, I would just submit, and then it'll take us to a separate page where we have important registration deadlines, how to pre-register, any same-day registration notices, um, automatic registration, and any documentation required. Um, and this is true for any state, and we wanted just to be able to um, give people as comprehensive as information as possible um, to start them on the process. Um, so in the case that you made a mistake and you want to check the voter registration information for another state, you basically click the link on the bottom or you can click our logo and it will return you back to the index page. And let's say I'm from California, so I can input CA 
um, for my state submit and we'll spit back information regarding voter registration um, in California. In addition to our state, our voter registration lookup, we also have a navigation bar on the top with actual links to help you with voter registration. So we have links that include how to register, um, registering to vote, requesting an absentee ballot for college students who can't necessarily go back to their own state because um, I'm not going to go back to California just for one day just to vote. Um, there are also a link to check your registration and we also included additional resources such as finding your polling place, 10 tips for voters, and frequently asked questions for voters. Um, so essentially, our um, the design of our web application was really, really simple, um, but we had a more ambitious like idea in order to implement this. We did want to implement like an API in order to get all the information, um, and we also wanted to in implement an SVG to create like an interactable map so that voter um, users can just click on their respective state and the voter, the voter registration information would pop up. Um, however, we did run into a lot of complications, so um, this was kind of born last minute over the weekend um, out of Eden and I's like hard work. Um, and we actually implemented a lot of stuff that we learned in CS50. Um, because it was stuff that we were actually really familiar with. So instead of using an API, we actually used SQL database to basically hard code all like the data uh, we found on voter registration information. So if you can see here, like we have pre-registration information, same day automatic and documentation. All the information that you saw on that one state HTML page, all is on right here. And instead of imp implementing like an SVG, we just decided to go with what we were familiar with, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, to create the whole table and the the text box to search out. So, yeah. I think another one like really interesting error that we interact um, came up with um, was when dealing with the CSS for the interactive map. Um, so we found the, uh, the code for the interactive map online, and we were going to be able to cite it, work it, and then put it into our website. However, we ran into the problem that the CS50 IDE wasn't necessarily recognizing some of the terms used in the CSS. So we realized that the CS50 IDE is actually operating with a program called CSS Lint, which basically um, keeps certain terms from being used to avoid the CS50 IDE from being um, damaged. But this does um, involve, uh, result in some problems when you're importing code. So we did try to download our code um, onto our desktop desktop and then upload it into Heroku so we could possibly implement it in an external um, environment, but that didn't necessarily work out, so yeah, we just kind of like returned back to our basics um, and a way that we knew how to implement it. Yeah, so looks like there were definitely a lot of challenges in making this project, but you still finished it and you have a nice final project. And um, overall, what would you say was one of your favorite experiences from CS50? I would say the general like culture of the class was unlike any other class that I've ever taken, anything that I've experienced. And I think the way that it was taught really was conducive to absorbing the vast amount of subject matter that we were expected to learn and grasp. And I think since it was a largely collaborative class, and I did spend a lot of time with fellow classmates in office hours, um, just like working through the problems together, um, I, I would say that's probably one of my favorite ex experiences with it. Uh, equally the same thing. I, I think like there's something about just being together and like struggling on a piece set that kind of just makes you bond with everyone. Like I think like without CS50, I would have gotten closer to Eden because we did spend a lot of nights together where it's just like us working on piece sets and struggling to get an answer. So yeah, it's definitely the culture. Thank you guys so much. Congratulations on your project. It was really nice seeing you guys at office hours and hard working. And um, I'm glad you're done with the semester and I hope you take maybe more CS in the future. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm Catherine and this was CS50. Hello world, uh, Colton here and I'm joined today by Bumluck here at the CS50 Fair at Yale. Uh, what year are you, Bumluck? Uh, I'm a sophomore at Yale College. Awesome, and you took CS50 this term. Was this your first uh, exposure to computer programming? To science? Yes, it was. Awesome, okay. And uh, what app did you develop for the project? So the app that I developed is a website called Volunteer Addis, which is able to connect volunteers with the uh, organizations or charities that they care about. Awesome, okay. Uh, why don't you give us a tour of uh, Volunteer Addis? Also, what, what is the name uh, Addis, Volunteer Addis? Where does that come from? Okay, so Volunteer Addis is uh, literally referring to volunteering in Addis, which is the capital city of Ethiopia. And I think uh, this website is useful in being able to uh, connect both volunteers and organizations because there's no centralized system that allows them to do so. Okay, so this has an actual real-world sort of inspired use case, which is really cool. Okay, awesome. Why don't you give us a tour of the uh, sort of features of your website? Yeah, for sure. So this is uh, volunteer address, so I can be able, so it's, you have volunteer as well as organization profiles. So for example, uh, signing in as an organization, and so, so I'm going to have to volunteer and then I can see the home page where I'm able to access the different stories that 
which serves as like a news feed for volunteering experience. And you can go to profile where I can update my profile picture, volunteering experience, work experience, as well as my email for, for, for organizations that want to contact me. Awesome profile picture, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I can even go to history, so organizations are able to um, add time of how much time I work, and I can see what they submitted. So it says like that they submitted as well as the time work. I can go to search, so I can search using organization name, category, as well as distance from where I'm located. So, for, for example, for category, if I say health, um, there's like it says to Red Cross, and then I can be able to like go and then see like the Ethiopian Red Cross Society and be able to access what they have. Um, and that same thing exists within the organization space, but uh, different features they are able to add uh, whatever time I worked, uh, and also be able to access volunteers. Uh, how much time they work, and then be able to select a good set of volunteers that will be able to work in their charity. And, you're, and part of your uh, registration actually involves uh, Google Maps integration, is that correct? Yes. So, uh, for example, when registering as an organization here, uh, there's a name, category, description, and then there's also a Google Maps feature. The reason I included this is because uh, in Addis, the streets, uh, the system for locating where a house is located uh, within a street is not as efficient. So I made it easier for users to just go and then click on where they're located and then it shows it automatically updates uh, latitude and longitude which is uh, used for search options such as when I say I want to work in an organization that is 200 miles from where I am located and it is able to calculate that and show all the organizations there. Awesome, I love it. And then let's talk a little bit about the technology you used to implement your project. So uh, what is this built on? What, what did you use to program this website? Uh, so uh, the basic one is using Python and Flask in order to be able to integrate like the Python with the HTML pages. And there's also the SQL version uh, for databases where there's an organization database as well as a volunteer database. And under those there are different features such as the amount of experience, um, how much time the volunteer worked, and also the personal details, which can be updated. And also there are features such as um, whenever registering, it sends you a link of like the different features that you can use. So in that, I use CS50 uh, feature, CS50 concepts such as using Gmail and uh, be able to connect with organizations. Awesome. And then, of course, the Google integration, which is super cool. It's like the next step beyond sort of the finance scaffolding from, from the finance piece set. Yes. Um, but yeah, this is super cool. And it's super cool that it has sort of a real-world inspired use case, too, which I think is, makes these projects all the better and sort of a more personal endeavor. Yes. Um, and also plan to uh, get this out of the CS50 library and be able to implement it uh, in Addis because there are many small organizations that don't have an actual website. And using this, they can create their own profile and have all their contact details. And volunteers can sign up for a mailing list which, where the organizations can send emails and then volunteers are updated about what is happening. And that would be sort of like the next steps features for implementing in your project? Yes. And something I also thought about and was working on but couldn't be able was wasn't able to finish in this project was a chatbot which directly connects uh, volunteers with the charities but uh, that is something I'm currently working on and within the break probably able to finish awesome well it sounds super inspired thank you very much for interviewing Bomlock it was a pleasure uh, this is CS50 hi everyone this is Kazemi I'm here with Alden Tatwe and Marilla tell me a little bit about your project guys Okay, so our project is a website for um, Yale students to um, connect with one another in their classes. Um, and they can find other people in their class and they can like, arrange times to piece it together. Yeah. So let's, let's see a little, let's see piece it party in action. Let's see how it works. All right, so um, over here, this is my home page after I've logged in. And um, I can search for classes here. And like, let's say I want to search for computer science classes. I can search like that. And then let's say I want to add CPSC 100 to my list of classes. So now CPSC 100, so this is my, my home page. And like, this is my classes that I'm taking. So if I go to CPSC 100, this is the home page. And I can see which other students are taking the class. Um, I can click calendar. And then I can see here like, um, which are the times which other students want to piece it. 
And I also have my own input here, um, which I can add via update availability. So going back to the calendar, um, when I'm actually doing the PSAT, I can indicate that I'm online to other students by clicking the PSAT on button, and then it'll turn green. Yeah. Um, also, if let's say I want to work with this student who's online now, I can just click on his name. His contact details are here. I can also send him an email um, in the website itself. For example, I can type hi and like, um, let's work together. And if I send him an email, so I've logged into Alden's email here. Oh no, I haven't. Um, yeah. So he'll receive an email from yelpsetparty at gmail.com. Mm. Yep. This is, this is really, what, what was the like, most difficult piece of putting all this together for you guys? Um, I think it was like the, the fine details. So for example, if, if I were go to a calendar, uh, we need to implement stuff like a check to see, you know, you can only PSAT on for like the stuff that you uploaded. And you can only press PSAT on for the PSAT parties on the day of the, uh, on the current day. So you can't like uh, d change your status for a PSAT party you schedule a week later. So it's all this like fine stuff that we had to like implement. Um, yeah, it was, it was mostly that. The, we had to also figure out how to do the um, update option and the email, how to send an email direct from the, um, from the, um, the website itself. Yeah, it was mainly that. I'm interested, like, when, doing the email, um, I've seen, like, I, I, from personal experience, I know that can be, like, kind of hard to, like, integrate that email feature. How, what was that like? Like, what's, what, what steps did you take to get that w up and running? Yeah, so we actually had a, a, sort, a short, like, um, lecture on it, or rather a short part of the lecture on it on, on a CS50 lecture. So there was already, like, code there that we could look at and understand. I think, um, I mean, going online to see like what specific like module to use or uh, what what specific code to use was was a bit uh, difficult. We chose to use uh, email specific for the website because it was just that much easier to integrate it with an uh, email without having to have the user enter their own email here because we were concerned about security issues, you know, because we weren't that confident that our website could like be that secure so that if you enter your email account and password that it would not be able to be hacked or something. So we just used uh, email for the website itself. Uh, instead, that was our solution. Yeah. So this looks really great. Like, do you, do you guys think you'll actually use it, or like, because like I could imagine like for CS50, especially like when office hours are not in session, yeah. this would be super helpful. Yeah, I think definitely there's a the potential to 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 make this into a real website for people to use, and I think. Um, we can definitely improve on this by adding all the classes available and like once we've um, posted the website onto an online server then I think it will actually be very useful to Yale students. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah there were a couple of things we wanted to like if you had more time to add on like we're thinking of like a group functionality to like indicate you know when you're working in a group so instead of just seeing one person's green dot you will see like a green dot with like a person's name and like four other people under that tab to show that you know there's a group of five, which will encourage more people to work together. Uh, for example, and we also wanted uh, thought about like a, a chat function and as opposed to an email function, which is a lot more uh, dynamic and faster to communicate with. Um, yeah, and I think because of how the website is created, in the sense that um, the only thing that is uh, specific to Yale is the classes itself. It also means that. Any other institution that wants to use it can just upload their own classes and this can like be exported there as well. So these are all like po possible options that can be made, yeah. Thank you so much. This this looks really cool. Like I hope you guys do like keep moving yeah. forward with it because I, I know I would like to use it. Once Thank again, you. this is Kazemi and this is CS50. Hi everyone, this is Kazemi again. Right now we're here with Jonathan. Jonathan, tell us a little bit about your project. Yeah, sure. So um, basically what I've built is a website that allows people to find um, other people who are have internships during the summer or even co-ops during the spring and fall um, that let them uh, room together uh, based on like a bunch of preferences they specify in the website. So basically you register for an account, um, then uh, the homepage just so shows you the profiles you've saved in the past, but let's say this was your first time, you go to update info, just specify a lot of information relevant to um, the kind of roommates you'd be looking for. So, if, for example, you'd put like, I like to keep my room messy. Um, once you've filled out all that, 
you can search for other profiles. Um, and since we don't have too many right now, I'm just going to show all of them. Uh, I see a bunch of uh, profiles from just all around the country, but you could search by location or name. Um, you see one you like, you can find out more, save it to your homepage, and then once you've done that, you can um, contact them. Did I actually save it? Well, anyways. But yeah, basically, um, yeah, it shows you the list of people you saved, and you can contact them in the future. Yeah. What, uh, what inspired you to make this? Is this something that like, you've had a problem with in previous summers, or that you like, envision seeing in future summers? Um, so I guess it's like not so much uh, something I've had in the past because I've been lucky enough to have internships like where I already live, yeah. but it's something I foresee happening in the future because I am moving somewhere else this summer. So um, yeah, definitely like looking for uh, roommates and thought this might be a great tool for people like me and even me to find roommates for the summer. Yeah. What was the most difficult uh, part to like integrate into into your website? I think like a lot of it was actually based off the P set eight. Um, but what I found difficult was that a lot of the um, functions in there, whenever there was like an error, it would just redirect you to an apology page. So what I tried to do was really add a lot of JavaScript code so that all that check all those checks would be done in the website without having to like send you to an error page. It would just like pop up at a little alert or something like that. Do you, do you have an example of that right now? I'm always fascinated by these JavaScript error messages. Yeah, sure. So um, I think there's one for search. So if we submit with no, well, actually, no doubt is a completely valid way. So let's log out um, and register and let's submit with like no data. We're going to get an alert that just says one of the fields is blank. Um, I didn't have time to add sort of like a more visually, uh, like a better way of showing it with just like a red uh, line of text there. But I think this just is a lot more convenient for the user than getting redirected to load another page that says, oh, you committed an error. So. That's pretty nifty. Can I like can I just like demo it out and like try yeah, adding? Nice. Okay. So my name is David. Oh, caps lock. My name is David Malin. So I mean it's for me, so I And so the JavaScript will also make sure like your password and confirmation password are the same. The email and confirmation email address are the same, stuff like that. Typing with one hand is not as fast as it seems. <laughs> so I think this is actually going to be a great example where oh, your emails didn't match. Did not match. CS50.edit did not like that. Oh, wow. OK, I am in city A <laughs> this summer, the spring. This is great that there are so many options and that there are so many different ways to pair up with different people. Yeah, and the good thing is I, um, they're not all required, so okay. uh, you don't have to go through all oh, of them for the purposes. Great. <laughs> but yeah, just David that. definitely keeps his room messy, plays <laughs> loud CS50 music, and goes to bed real late. <laughs> and yeah, so if you go to my profile, you can now see David's profile. That is that is exactly David lives in, in the city of A. This look, yeah, this looks this looks really great, and, and like everything that was there is, is everything that I input. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This looks yeah, this looks really great. All right, this is Kazemi, and this is CS50. Hi, this is Kazemi, and I'm here with Michelle and Tui. Uh, tell me a little bit about your project. Our CS50 founder project, we decided to do a virtual reality game called Cat Collector using the platform Unity. And over here on this screen, uh, we kind of have how the user would experience it. So um, when a player actually plays our game, they would need the Oculus Rift hardware. So they put on their headset, and they have to have two controllers. And over here on the, this screen, we have our um, actually our project files open in a software called Unity, which we use to develop our game. So unfortunately, we're not able to transport the headset or the controller because you need like two base stations that are able to like record your movement in 360 degrees. So like this is the next best alternative, showing you what like a pre-recorded video of me putting on the headset and then looking at the terrain. And so as you can see the terrain, there's like this nice floral background. There's grass that's movable, which is really cool. And so there's a really nice skybox as well. There's an ocean to your side. You're able to look around, which is really cool. And so I can move around here, which is not really the same as the headset. 
Barca experience, but it's good enough, I think. And so you're transported here. You're, the first thing you see is this really nice guitar. And then do you want to talk about like more of the functions for it? Of course. So our game offers a couple of primary features. Um, the first one being that you're kind of teleported to this very serene, peaceful island, and you find this magical guitar next to you. Um, so then the second feature is that we wrote a script so that you're actually able to interact with the guitar so you can pick it up. And the next coolest feature is that we actually added chords onto the guitar so that when your controller hovers over each of the chord, it plays a different musical note. And our last feature is that there's like this um, white, you know, majestic cat lying on the very top of the hill. And once you actually pick up the guitar and start playing music for a bit, the cat will actually hear the music and run down towards the user. So overall, we're trying to offer a very relaxing experience and make it fun and exciting. What? Th this is this is remarkable. Like, what what languages did you need to use? Because a lot of this does not look like the C or the HTML JavaScript covered in class. So what 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 like what was the learning curve like for all of this? Yeah, the learning curve was definitely really steep because we've never really had experience with VR. But like from our suggestion, um, we should use Unity because it's a really popular like game playing platform. And so Unity actually has like these different components already integrated into it. So a big part of it was just learning what components are there, what you need to use. And so there's different scripts like this. There's a throwable script. There's an interactable script. There's audio sound. There's definitely millions of scripts that like are available. But we don't really know what to do. And so like a big part of it was just Googling around and like it's part of the process of seeing like how do we make stuff move? How do we interact with it? Like why is our hand moving through the object? How do we make sound? And so a part of it was just going through the asset stores and seeing like what scripts are available, um, transporting them there and then making them interchangeable into what we want. That's, that, this is crazy. This is so, this is so cool. And what inspired uh, you guys to make Cat Collector. Like, what's what's the story? What's the Genesis story for Cat Collector? So we've heard David Milan really likes his cats, seeing from the, the ID and from our PowerPoints, and we also really like cats, I suppose. And so during the fight, like, the home stretch to finals, we're all, like, really stressed, and so we wanted to make this, like, really nice, relaxing game. And so, like, what's better than seeing a giant cat come toward you and just hug it? <laughs> Yeah, like in addition to you know kind of the CS50 obsession with cats, uh, we figured we also wanted to like challenge ourselves and try like using a new software and maybe and tap into all like the very like immersive environment that the VR technology offers. Um, so we had a lot of fun like learning like this new technology and playing around with it. This looks great, guys. I, like, where where, do, where what's next for Cat Collector? What is next? Is there, is there a next step? Is there a next step? Yeah. We actually had a van named Scotty who works for the Yale um, Environmental Forestry who asked us, like, what's the next step? And, like, are you going to publish it? Because he wants to play it. So maybe publish it on Unity so that you can download the folder. And, like, in your home, you're able to play Cat Collector and collect all the cats. I will, I will be the first to pre-order it. This looks like so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle and Tui. This is, this is like... Great job. Um, once again, I'm Kazemi, and this is CS50.